Well, thank you, Janet. Uh, thank you, John, for being here today. It's an honor to receive the award that's named after you. Uh, Stan, you know, it's my first time in Sick Kids. That's uh, unbelievable, but we have crossed paths in many uh, different places. So uh, I'm gonna go back to, my, to, to the beginning of my trajectory as a researcher and, and tell you a bit about uh, you know, what motivated me to do research in this area and also on, on how some of this research actually helped change policy, which is the greatest uh, uh, pleasure and satisfaction that any researcher can have. As we all know, the vast major majority of births in the world take place in, in the areas that are, have a larger surface in this distorted uh, world map. Uh, yet the birth cohort studies tend to be carried out in places where most births are not happening. So I uh, said, so we, we got to do something about it. Uh, so uh, we decided to start birth cohort study in Pelotas, and that was done with my colleague, Fernando Bajos, who's been working with me for over 40 years now. Uh, Pelotas is in the extreme south of Brazil. It's almost in Uruguay. Um, has a population of 340,000, and when we started studying Pelotas, it had an infant mortality rate of about 40 per thousand, now it's down to 15. You know, good progress, but it's still five times higher than in, it, it would be in, in a highly developed country. Uh, so uh, a lot happened in, in Pelotas since we started our cohort, and there were lots of transitions. Uh, we were started being interested in, in infant mortality, diarrhea deaths, undernutrition, low birth weight, and suddenly the world changed. And now uh, we are interested in overweight and obesity and cardiovascular disease and mental health and so on. And the, so our work with the cohort somehow uh, reflects these uh, changes in, in globalization. Uh, we started the first cohort in 82. Each cohort has every birth in the city of Pelotas. There were 6,011 births in 82. In 82, we are, have managed to trace and examine 68% uh, of the cohort at the age of 30 years, which is uh, uh, something we're very proud about. And then, every 11 years, we start a new cohort. And here are the follow-up rates. They, they are different ages, so we can not only uh, compare what, you know, relate what happened in early life to, to current health or intelligence or income or whatever. We can also look across the cohorts and see how things are changing over time. And people ask me, why 11 years? Well, that's because we wanted to do it every 10 years. But the funding was late. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get the money in time for the 93 cohort. They said, okay, now we're stuck with 11 years. So uh, let's keep doing that. So. And as uh, Janet mentioned, you know, we have over 20,000 people involved. I go to a restaurant and the waiter says, oh, I'm from your 93 cohort. You know, I'm famous. <laughs> but Pilates is not such a big place, so everybody knows me. So they know about the cohorts, and those who are in the cohort, they will come and salute. And it's, and it's just happened yesterday in Ottawa. Um, now, uh, that's when we started, you know. Uh, you may not recognize this guy there with a lot of hair. That, that used to be me. <laughs> and, and down there was Fernando. Uh, our first grant was from IDRC, Canada. So, you know, really grateful for this country. Uh, we asked for $25,000. Uh, they visited Pilates and said we needed 50. And we were really surprised. They gave us $50,000, which is a lot of money for uh, two, two researchers like Fernando and myself were just beginning. And we had a single computer, so we had to take turns. It was the first microcomputer in Pelotas. Uh, you know, paper questionnaires. Uh, we're using telephone landlines to call people in the cohorts, and we did the home visits. And Pelotas, and, I'm, and Michael, Pelotas is a great place for a social epidemiology. We've been doing that. Uh, it would be a, a great place for social epigenetics because we have very poor uh, and as well, uh, quite rich people live in Pelotas. And because our cohorts includes everybody who was born in a given year, we have the full social spectrum. Brazil being, unfortunately, one of the most unequal countries in the world in terms of income distribution. 
So uh, we managed to do that. Uh, this is our first questionnaire. Uh, front and back, we didn't have that much money. The, the IDRC money came in in May, so we had to start with our own money. So we found the largest piece of paper that was sold in Pelotas, and we printed front and back, <laughs> and we had 80, 80 variables. And but it's amazing how much you can get out of 80 variables. And so this is our uh, baseline questionnaire. Uh, also, 80 variables because we were using punch cards, and punch cards, you know, those of us who are in the generation here <laughs> know what punch cards are. <laughs> and now, but now we're actually, we're, we're doing much better. We have two buildings just for our cohorts, and we really have state-of-the-art uh, body composition research, car uh, cardiovascular uh, equipment. We have GWAS in the cohort. We're starting to do epigenetics in our cohorts as well. And so we're really uh, up to date now, thanks to generous funding, particularly from the Wellcome Trust. Uh, the, the cohorts are all population-based. They included all births in the city. And we, we used to do home visits, but then we built the clinic. So since uh, 2010, they actually come to our clinic and they, they do a full set of exams that we could not be able to do at home. And they're multi-purpose cohorts. I mean, there's no sense in having a cohort if you're only looking at nutrition or, or cardiovascular measurements there. You know, we have uh, growth, we have nutrition, we have chronic diseases, mental health, we have human capital, intelligence development. We're looking at the next generation and so on. So uh, the thing is, it got, we got to a time in which we said, okay, we're having all these nice results from Pelotas, but is, you know, what about, is that, representative, quote unquote, you know, that's an impossible question to, to answer, in fact, in epidemiology. But what about what's happening in other places of the world? And that's when we uh, decided to set up the cohorts network, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, because uh, uh, as we all know, uh, prospective cohorts are necessary for understanding early determinants, and because the results from middle uh, low and middle income countries may differ from those in the cohorts, as we saw in my second slide. They are fully, uh, mostly coming from Scandinavia, England, the US, Canada. So there are different exposures, there are different outcomes, the nature of exposures is different, the confounding structure is different, and that's something we can make use of, in fact, to, to improve the quality of, of inference. Um, uh, for example, uh, can we really uh, extrapolate to a developing country like Brazil? Uh, the results from the cohorts from Finland where kids are born with 3.5 kilos, and whereas our kids are born with you know, just around three kilos. So can we extrapolate findings on the benefits or the risks of rapid weight gain in infancy when we're talking about such different uh, starting points. And in, unfortunately, like our pediatricians and our doctors tend to read the international literature, and when we're getting all these alarming findings about uh, putting weight rapidly in infancy is really terrible for you, but is it? So that's a question I want to address uh, next year. Uh, we were invited in, in, 19, uh, in 2008 to write the Lancet now, one paper in the Lancet Maternal and Child Undernutrition Series jointly with uh, Bob, my Maureen's uh, husband, and we decided to pull cohorts from low and middle income countries. We get larger sample sizes, we get better external validity because we can confirm findings in different places of the world, we get less publication bias because we agree on the analysis a priori and then we publish for all results, and hopefully we have a greater impact on policy. And that's when we created the cohorts group. So basically out of the blue, I, I, I wrote to these people, most of whom I did not know personally, and we, I said, would you like to join us in, in having a consortium of cohorts from low and middle income countries? These are all cohorts with at least 1,000 people and at least 20 years follow up. Uh, we actually spent the first uh, meeting uh, most of the time coming up 
with the acronym Consortium of Health Orientated <laughs> Research in Transitioning Societies. So, and we came up with that, and it was, and, but yeah, I, I can assure that in, in the following meetings we had more science. And just by chance, you know, just by, good, by luck, and science is also made of luck, you know. Uh, we had one cohort in Guatemala, Central America, one in, in Brazil, one in South Africa, one in Delhi, and one in the Philippines. So we had a pretty good representation uh, of the different continents. Now, uh, going back to the idea of a thousand days, uh, this is a, we published this paper in pediatrics in 2001, and then we repeated it in 2010. And uh, we just took 54 uh, DHS surveys from low and middle income countries. We took the average uh, weight and length for age uh, by age in months. And we've flattened the curve. You've seen some curves like that earlier in the other presentations. So a, a child growing along the zero line would be uh, uh, growing exactly along the median weight or height per age. And you see that uh, faltering uh, actually starts early uh, in Europe. So that they're already born a little bit below uh, the, the zero line. But it then takes place in, in relative terms, in z-score terms. Faltering takes place until two years of age. And then kids run parallel to the center. They, 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 reach a certain centile and they tend to remain on that. That's what we call growth canalization. So there's a lot happening in the first thousand days. Uh, unfortunately, I did, when I did this in 2001, I, I did not have the idea of adding the number of days, but that, that came later. Uh, that was actually done by PR people who were trying, uh, developing a campaign. And, uh, but the point is there's a lot happening here in the first thousand days. And as we have seen from others too, uh, uh, these thousand days uh, are essential for uh, intellectual development. Now, this is a, a, an old study from, uh, it's moving very fast, old study by David Pelletier, in which he looks at the risk of mortality according to weight for age. And obviously, the higher weights are associated with lower mortality. So having high weight in early life is good for you. But the higher your weight, the less, lower your mortality. And now I'm now going to go through the, the three sets of the cohorts analysis to, to let you see how our thinking evolved and became more, our que research questions changed. So when we first got together, we wanted to answer a, a question which is relatively simple. Uh, how does undernutrition in utero and during the first few years of life affect the health and performance of adolescents and adults living in low and middle income countries <laughs> using data from the, the six cohorts? And this was the first paper that came out in the Lancet series. And I'm talking about human capital in the sense of adult height that is being able to reach one's biological potential, potential for growth, uh, linear growth. Uh, schooling, income, and next generation health, like offspring birth weight. So uh, we started doing uh, meta-analysis. Uh, and that's, a, that's a little interesting, too, because it reflects the way people collaborate. We had just met the five cohorts. So people were not very happy sharing their data, their, their uh, full data sets. So we said, let's do meta-analysis. Let's do analysis in the same way in the five cohorts. As trust developed and we got to know better the other players, we actually share all data now uh, be between, uh, among all groups. But the striking thing here, you know, I'm sure many of you have seen lots of meta-analysis in your life, is how remarkably consistent this is. So this is length, uh, adult length, uh, agro height, sorry, according to length at two years of age. And uh, one standard deviation in or one z-score in length at two years of age is associated with a 3.2 uh, increase in height, adult height. And the striking thing, do you know how much a uh, standard deviation is at age two? 3.2. So it's exactly, you know, down to the decimal point. If you're 
on average, if you're 3.2 centimeters taller at age two, you are 3.2 centimeters taller as an adult. Remarkable, you know? But you know, okay, we're measuring the same thing. Uh, length and height are the same thing. It shows that canalization does happen and that people keep on the same track. But what about schooling? I mean, schooling is a mess, isn't it? Uh, different countries have different school systems. There are different things that make people get better or less, to do well or less well at school. But look at that. One standard deviation of length at age two was associated with half a year of schooling more. And remember, these are developing countries. You know, the average schooling in some of these is four years, five years. So half a year is a substantial difference and remarkably similar. So there must be something in those brains in the epigenetic, in their epigenomes that is contributing to that. So very clear results. But what about the other side? Yeah, what about obesity? Does putting on weight or being taller at age two, increase your risk. And we found, we looked at glucose, we looked at blood pressure, we looked at BMI, and we didn't find much. No consistent results. We didn't find that kids who were heavier or taller at two years of age had more uh, cardiovascular disease in our societies, okay? Now, the reason we were worried is that, that just before that, there were all these results coming from developed country uh, cohorts showing that uh, kids who put on a lot of weight between birth and usually seven years, that's a, one of the points, one of the problems. They got the kids, uh, like uh, for the Finland cohorts, they measure kids at birth, they had their birth weight from records, and then they have entrance at school. And say, oh, if you put on weight from zero to seven, you're really in trouble. But we think we need a finer age, uh, slice it in finer ages, and that's the point of, our, uh, of the next slides I'm gonna show you. So the, the main uh, findings from cohorts, one, the first set of analysis, was that uh, uh, IUGR and stunting in the first year lead to long-term reduction in human capital but there's no clear association between body size and NCD precursors uh, and when we look just at the first two years of life. So we moved on to the second cohort uh, collaboration, which was 2007 to 2009. And we said, let's split weight gain into finer periods and let's see what's happening there. So uh, we, uh, sorry, this is moving too fast. So we use this technique called conditional uh, weight, which, which were just for previous weights, because weights are correlated. So you, you get rid of that by adjusting weight for previous weight and adjusting height for previous height and previous weight as well. It's a bit complicated, but if you, if you want to learn more, uh, this, this type of analysis was developed by someone from our uh, collaboration, uh, Clive Osmond, a, st a statistician from Bristol. And we looked at uh, uh, several outcomes. This is really going fast. We looked at several outcomes. We published about 10 papers from that. And now I'm gonna really summarize it for lay, for lay people. I know this is not a lay audience, but the older I get, the more concerned I get about being understood and translating knowledge to people who can make a difference like policymakers. And so when I came with the slides you're gonna see now, my colleague said, oh, these are cartoons, you know? They don't have confidence intervals, and they are a gross oversimplification. I said, that's it. That's exactly what I want. <laughs> you know, I want a rigorous gross oversimplification. <laughs> and I came with this slide. I said, okay, so in the bottom we have ages, birth, one, two, four, adult. Uh, the blue line shows good things. Good things is one, not dying, which is really good, and two, developing uh, human capital, being intelligent, tall, having healthy uh, kids in the next generation, and so on. So if you put on weight rapidly, and conditional weight is a measure of that, uh, before birth, in first and second year of life, you get all these good things. If you put on weight rapidly after two years of age, you don't get these things. And this is summarized in our 15 papers on that subject. Now, what about the other side of the coin? 
That's very different. If you put on weight rapidly in utero, so if you have a good birth weight, you're actually protected against uh, most of these conditions. You have lower glucose. You know, there are beneficial effects, and that's a Barker hypothesis, right? You know, low birth weight being a marker for future cardiovascular diseases. If you put on weight in the first year, it doesn't help that much, but it doesn't do you any harm, and two years, still okay, but then if you put on weight after that, that's when the risk for uh, cardiovascular disease uh, happens. So we have this graph here, which is saying there's something around the first two years, there's something around 1,000 days, that you're still building up lean mass, you're developing your brain, you know, well, it's, our brain, 70% of our brain size is acquired by age two. You have more nephrons, you have more beta cells in your pancreas, your, your liver is better developed, you're better able to cope with all the overload of westernized diets that our countries are going through because you, your organs are healthier and, and more capable to handle. So I'm not recommending junk food, but I say if you, uh, if you are eating junk food, you better have a good liver and a good pancreas and develop early in your life. Now, the key messages from the cohorts too was that uh, for human capital, weight gain in euro and during the first two years of life is beneficial, but rapid weight gain after two years does not confer any advantages. And for NCD, the real problem is rapid weight gain after two years of life. And so that led us to cohorts three, and I'm gonna go quickly through this, in which we decided, oh, we need to disentangle weight gain from linear growth. Because linear growth is lean mass, good things for you, and we looked at weight gain above and beyond what was necessary for linear growth. And our, our main conclusions from these analysis uh, were like this. If you just look at weights, that's what we had before on top. On the left, the relative weight gain that is growing uh, putting on weight beyond what is necessary for linear growth, you have really bad effects on glucose and you have no benefits on schooling. So even in the first year of life, if you're putting more weight than you're growing in length, it doesn't help. And for linear growth, it's very different. Linear growth has all this massive effect on schooling and uh, little, little effect on, on uh, systolic pressure or glucose, uh, regardless of the age. So the, the summary message here is that rapid weight gain after two to four years increases the risk of NCD. Linear growth has few of these detrimental effects, if any, and linear growth improves human capital. So the real challenge for policy here is that it's a, this is a complex policy measure, me, uh, 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 message. We have to really promote weight gain, make sure the kids are growing properly, we have to promote linear growth, but after a certain age, we have to prevent <coughs> kids from putting on weight. I'm not sure how to solve that, but it's, a, it's important to realize that by splitting a weight and, and, and length gains into narrower age ranges, we were able to grasp the very different consequences of both processes. I'm not sure how, this is a cohort collaboration, quite a few, quite a few uh, faces around here. Uh, I just wanted to tell you some recent findings from the cohorts and uh, see what, where we're going. Now, as I said, we now have a pretty complex uh, lab set up in which we do a number of tests uh, and we also do IQ. So we have IQ at age 30 for everybody. This is, uh, uh, it's, uh, we have IQ for about 4,000 people. Uh, this is a paper we just published in Journal of Pediatrics. Uh, it's slightly different shape, the graph, but again, linear growth is blue and weight gain, relative weight gain on top of linear growth is red. This is the impact on uh, IQ. So uh, birth weight, which is the first bar there, uh, is associated with less than one point increase in IQ after adjusting for a, a whole bunch of confounding factors. Uh, linear growth has a very definite effect, almost two IQ points, and after that, and relative weight gain does not, and in fact, if anything, rapid weight gain after age two 
is associated with lower IQs. Now, I'm not causing saying that's cause and effect, but it's very consistent with what uh, Susan just showed of, from, from the, the trials, you know, in, uh, in Jamaica. Uh, I now want to jump to breastfeeding, which is my favorite topic, and Kay's favorite topic, too. I'm sure it is. Uh, and we were able to look at IQ at age 30. Uh, we started the meta-analysis. We published that in the Acta Pediatrica. And the, the good quality observational studies are quite consistent with higher IQ uh, being associated with breastfeeding. There are two randomized trials that I'm aware of, one in Belarus, one in the UK trial by Lucas in, in the 70s. They sh also show an effect. And yet, it's a very controversial subject, you know? And we said, so we set out to say, okay, but is this effect on breastfeeding? Most of these studies are on kids. Is this effect long-lasting? So does it really make a difference? As Susan was great in showing that some of the effects that she found with nutritional supplementation were not long-lasting. Uh, so we tried to look at that in breastfeeding. And does it have any practical implications? And then we came up with these results. Uh, in 1982, we have 6,011 births, of whom 5,914 were live borns, and we did not have a strong social pattern of breastfeeding. Actually, we had no social pattern. Breastfeeding was very short, and it wasn't like uh, Canada or the UK or US where the rich and, and more educated mothers tend to breastfeed longer, and this is what led many people to challenge the results from observational studies. We didn't have that. Everybody breastfed just about the same. And there was no great awareness that breastfeeding was good for you. And so uh, in 2012, we measured IQ in 3,700 subjects at the age 30. And this is what we got. The, the, we have the different durations of breastfeeding in months. So we have a dose response effect with IQ. We have a dose response effect with schooling. Uh, about one year schooling more, and ag again, this is a society where average schooling is about eight years, so one year more can make the difference whether you, you complete high school or not. And they made more money, so going back to the money issue. And uh, actually, you, you can draw a straight line, there's a significant linear trend here, but some people come to us and say, hey, what's happening to this last group here? You know, they, they're making less money than the other one. Yeah, yeah. You know, but they, they are, they are really intelligent. They're, they are, they have lots of schooling. They don't make money. I think they must be academics. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> there's something there. <laughs> maybe, maybe that, I'm not sure it's a good explanation. Then we went on and we did some really fancy state of the art epidemiological statistical analysis using mediation analysis. And we could show that 72% of the increase in income was mediated through uh, IQ. So in a, a real plausible uh, uh, mediation there. This study got amazing press. You know, I've never had a study. You know, you know I was sitting at home at night and seeing a rolling headlines on CNN, breastfeeding associated with higher income. You know, I said, that really, and got a lot of hate mail too, by the way. <laughs> Now, and just to finish, I want to say, uh, now, what can we do about, can we improve this kind of uh, inference? And yes, we can, because now we have genome-wide, uh, we have GWAS in the cohort, and then we, we applied this uh, educational attainment allele score that was developed from a multi-cohort consortium uh, in Europe, which does not include our cohort. And we say, okay, this is a good predictor of schooling. Uh, why schooling and not intelligence? Because not that many cohorts have IQ, but lots of cohorts have schooling. So uh, this, was, this came out in nature and identified uh, uh, places in the genome were, uh, which were associated with the education. And we ran this in our cohort. And if you look at the correlation coefficients with schooling, IQ, and income, they're all positive. You know, they're the 0 0.2, 0 0.3 with IQ, which is pretty good. I mean, IQ is completely multifactorial, so that you have an intelligence score. But they were not correlated with breastfeeding. In fact, they had a very slight negative correlation, so that mm, kids were breastfed for longer 
had lower genetic scores. I mean, uh, and obviously everything is p less than 0.001 because the sample size is huge. But we, th we can demonstrate with this that in our society, uh, there's no genetic trend for those kids who end up being breastfed for longer as if because they had intelligent parents. That was not associated. And when we adjusted for the genetic sco score, our pattern of association, the dark blue line with breastfeeding remained the same. Now, uh, I'm coming to the end of my talk, and, and I just want to tell you a couple things. Uh, doing long-term birth cohorts is a lot of work. Uh, you have to be young enough. Uh, my cohort will outsurvive me for sure. Uh, so I ha I'm training a lot of young epidemiologists who can continue the work. Uh, Michael, by the way, the, the, we're doing uh, 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 epigenetic studies now, and we're finding quite a few uh, places in the genome where there's a lot of methylation. There are places related uh, to, to uh, intelligence and, and development. So. I'd be really interested in collaborating with you on that because it's, it could be yet another explanation for why breastfeeding, breastfeeding uh, influences development. I skipped the explanations altogether, but there's lots of things in breast milk that uh, contribute to a healthier uh, brain growth and development. Now, uh, the, big kish, uh, the big questions with cohorts, one of them is how big is your cohort and how in-depth can you be? Uh, the second one is you may do state-of-the-art measures now, but in 30 years' time, they are hopeless. So what we did in the early, we have weight and length in the early life, which is actually pretty good. We didn't have anything else. Uh, we also need to, to uh, convince funders that birth cohorts are, are long-term investments. Funders tend to be get, get tired of long studies and switch uh, somewhere else. IDRC helped us for a couple of years and then moved on to other things. But fortunately, we managed to do that. And I see a lot of young faces here, and uh, I can think, I can tell you, you know, doing research and, and, and being able to do research that influences policy uh, uh, takes creativity, but it takes uh, persistence. No, don't, it takes a lot of persistence. And I think that's a story from the Pelotas cohorts. Thank you very much.